Okay, welcome back to members of 121 Community Church in Grapevine, Texas, and our ongoing study in Paul and Jesus by James Tabor, published in 2012. We're going to take a look at uh, Paul's unique contributions to the rite of baptism and his unique contribution to the rite of the Eucharist. They are significantly deeper in meaning when it comes to Paul, and Professor Tabor is going to walk us through this. We're going to look at pages 138 to 158. Let's begin with block one and take a look at uh, the movement from John the Baptist to Paul regarding baptism. And there is a unique separation. 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 17. The division among the Corinthians was demarcated around what kind of baptism was being followed. Some said Apollos, some said Paul. In the book of Acts, we learn that uh, in Asia Minor, in Greece, there was an early form of Christianity that still practiced the baptism of John. And this early form continued up through the mid-50s. Paul's unique mysterion of the gospel was just beginning to take hold in the mid-50s. He had a much deeper understanding of baptism in three key texts, says Professor Tabor. In Galatians, we are baptized into the identity of Christ. In Corinthians, we are baptized into the spirituality of Christ. In Romans, we are baptized into the death of Christ. All of these emphasize the fact that uh, the rite further reinforces the previous lesson where we discussed what does it mean to be in the Messiah? What does it mean to be in Christ? Let's look at note two. Uh, to the mystical union, the believer becomes a son of God and enjoined into the one spiritual body, and the agency of Christ's spirit animates the collective body, the ecclesia. The outer shell of the flesh is passing away, and the inner person is being renewed in Christ every day. Christ becomes, therefore, life-giving spirit. God does manifest himself through the agency of spirit. And spirit, or pneuma, means unseen force, like the wind. The conclusion, therefore, is that believers are in Christ, and also indwelt by Christ. Believers are in Christ, and they are also indwelt by the Spirit of Christ. So, Paul posits a baptism that affects true effective change in history. If you look at note three, baptism affects change in the cosmos. The specific aspects of, bap of uh, baptism into Christ, it usually took place in a river or a stream. There was the questioning of the candidate, do you confess Jesus as Lord, crucified and raised and capable to forgive sins? Then there was the cry of Maranatha, which was the summoning of the Holy Spirit to come. Because for Paul, the baptism of the Holy Spirit was simultaneous with water baptism. Then there was the communal response of Amen. And then when the candidate came out of the water, they would cry, Abba, Abba, Father, <clears throat> to uh, make it a moment of recognition that they have been adopted into becoming a citizen of the kingdom. And note for there was the belief by Paul the positive truth that there's the simultaneous reception of the Holy Spirit at the same moment of baptism. Romans and Galatians both emphasize this. And baptism is also when the candidate receives the guarantee of sonship and the spiritual gifts are also received at this simultaneous moment of water baptism and spirit baptism. So Paul again, further reinforces his doctrine of salvation being equal to being in the Messiah. Believers don't only follow the message of the Messiah. Believers are in the Messiah, and it comes to fruition in baptism, also in the Eucharist in block two. Now in block two, we begin with the uh, early Pauline position in Corinthians. Paul says that uh, 
Christ says, do this in remembrance of me. In Mark, there's a statement that the, the wine represents the covenant being poured out for many. Professor Tabor tells us that tradition says that this Eucharist narrative was circulated throughout the Christian community in an oral way initially before it ever became writing. Paul could have received his narrative from Peter and James in AD 40 during the first Jerusalem visit, but Professor Tabor reminds us that's a doubtful hypothesis because Paul always claimed direct revelation from Christ, especially in his uh, retreat into Arabia. And one of the gifts of the Spirit was the word of knowledge, which would be a gift given to Paul. Paul says that he speaks by the word of the Lord, by the direct revelation he has received from the Lord. And Professor Tabor reminds us that Paul is our earliest account. The Gospel accounts come much later with regarding Eucharist. So it's Paul first and then it's Mark. Pa Mark gets his words of Jesus concerning the Eucharist from Paul. John, in his Gospel, he leaves out the words of Jesus spoken over the bread and the wine. John intentionally excludes Paul's source material. He preferred not to use Paul's source material. Now, we need to take a look at the Jewish emphasis on the Eucharist from the Didache. The words of Jesus are excluded here as well in the Didache. Instead, it records the following. The cup equals give thanks to the Father for the holy vine of David. The bread equals give thanks to the Father for the life and the knowledge in Christ. And Jesus himself perceived the Last Supper as the Messianic banquet, the anticipation of the coming kingdom of God, the Jewish perspective. However, Professor Tabor tells us if we look at Luke, the close companion to Paul in ministry, we find the Jewish view and the Pauline view both given to us together. In Luke 22, 15 through 18, we have the Jewish position of anticipating the kingdom of God. In Luke 22, 19 through 21, we have the Pauline position of mentioning the body and the blood of Christ. So these two rites, the rites of baptism and the rite of the Eucharist, are deeply and more profoundly narrated by Paul, says Professor Tabor, because he had received the musterion of the gospel in Arabia, directly revealed to him by Christ. So what does it mean to participate in the baptism? What does it mean to participate in the Eucharist? If you look at block three, we get uh, teaching from Professor Tabor on communal participation. The community does participate in the Christological death. In Corinthians, the Eucharist represented participation in the body and the blood of Christ. It meant participation in the death of Christ. It reenacted the Passion event. And it demanded a deep self-examination before participation could take place. But it is also the Ecclesia participating in Christological life. The Eucharist also represented participation in the healing life, life of Christ, the Pharmacon. Ephesians also provides this emphasis in chapter 20. Irenaeus in the second century declared that participation in the Eucharist ensured one's future resurrection. And in 1 Thessalonians, we are to participate in the Eucharist until the coming parousia, returning advent of Christ. We participate in the reenactment we participate in the Musterion, deeper truth of the Eucharist, until the Parousia returning advent, according to Paul. So we get the significant teaching here on how Paul transformed the baptism of repentance from John the Baptist to a baptism into Christ, which supported his gospel of salvation through being in Christ, in the Messiah. It isn't the message Paul emphasizes, it's the person.
Paul emphasizes, and he emphasizes the person by articulating the doctrine of baptism, the rite of baptism, as also participation in the person of Jesus Christ. And the Eucharist as well, for Paul, must be participation in the body and in the blood of the person of Jesus Christ. It isn't only looking forward to kingdom. It is looking forward to kingdom because it's the kingdom that belongs to Christ. It is looking forward to his kingdom. But it's more than that for Paul because the deeper mystery is that it is real, subjective, and objective participation in the blood and the body of Jesus Christ, in his death, in his resurrection. So it becomes a rite that fully illustrates salvation being equal to becoming a believer in the Messiah. Again, Paul emphasizes person over message. He emphasizes the person of Christ, the Savior. He uses the concept of Savior. It's not the political messianic figure. It is the Savior come down from heaven, the living bread come down from heaven, the living wine come down from heaven. And as a community, as a church, we participate in the Christological death. As a church, as a community, we participate in the Christological life. We do this by, in a public way, participating in baptism and in a public, visible way, taking up the remembrance of Eucharist in our congregations. But for Paul, within this deeper understanding, within this deeper mysterion, it's always the deeper mysterion for Paul. It is not the theology of the Ebionites. It is not the baptism that the Ebionites practiced. It is not the Eucharist that the Ebionites practiced. It is a deeper baptism and a deeper Eucharist centered on a salvation through baptism into Christ and participation in the body and the blood of the person of Jesus Christ. Extremely significant difference in what Paul narrated and taught. And again, Professor Tabor reminds us, Paul's is our earliest teaching. The Gospels came later. Paul is the earliest. And he gives us a deeper Musterion concerning the rites of baptism and the Eucharist, which go hand in hand with his deeper Musterion for the Evangelion Gospel. And that gives us a, actually a very powerful lesson here. I guess if we had a recall triad, it would be a baptism into Christ, Eucharist into the body and blood of Christ, and communal participation in the death and the resurrection. And we will pick up next time. Uh, this, that took us through 138 to 158. We'll pick up on page 159 next time.